Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, What Government Communicators in IT Must Know About Social Media Records, which means you need to understand your responsibility under Arizona's law. This is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow for the Center for Digital Government. I'm also a national technology media analyst on several of the national networks. But I'm excited to serve as a moderator for today's event, and I just want to thank you for joining us, especially those of you in warmer climates. I know we're in for an informative session over the next 60 minutes. But before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes, if you don't mind. Now, a recording of this presentation will be emailed to all registrants within 48 hours. Now, you can use this recording for your reference, or feel free to pass it along to all of your friends and colleagues. And also, you'll see a Q&A box on the bottom left of the presentation panel. Please send in your questions as they come up throughout the presentation. Our two speakers today will address as many of these questions as we can at the end during the Q&A portion at the close of our webinar today. So joining me today to discuss this very timely topic, because we all have heard a lot about social media, is Jerry Lucente Kirkpatrick. He's the records analyst for the Archives and Records Management Library, Archives and Public Records for the Arizona Secretary of State. And this is why Jerry just answers the phone. Hi, this is Jerry. And then also we have with us Anil Chawla. He's the founder and chief executive officer of Archive Social, one of the sponsors of today's webinar. So what we're going to do is I'm pleased to start getting started, uh, and let me introduce, as I said, uh, the two folks here, so you'll see that on the screen. There's Jerry, there's Janelle, there's myself. Here's our agenda today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview um, about riding the social media wave, how Arizona is getting ahead of the digital tsunami. Then we're going to hear from Jerry about the intersection of social media and records management. And then finally we'll end with Anil talking about social media and public records, and we'll really get some real-world examples and solutions. And then we'll do live Q&A at the end. So what I want to do is kind of set the stage about how Arizona is getting ahead of this. But first of all, just a little bit about the center. Uh, we have a lot of award-winning publications covering information technology's role. Uh, we do national research and advisory. We have an institute on information technology policies and best practice in state and local government. So please check out all our resources. Recommend us to your friends. And if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact one of us. So what we're going to do today is, by way of this introduction, this is what it's all about today. It's about ones and zeros. Now, if somebody can tell me what those ones and zeros stand for, uh, just post it as a question. Uh, you win the free gift today, which we haven't decided what it is, but it may be the foot of snow we have where I'm at. But what really, we're really talking about, that's my name right there, Morgan Wright. And what we're really talking about today is ones and zeros. It's about social media. It's about records. It's about digital. So let's talk a little bit first about Arizona, and let's welcome everybody to Arizona. Now, I made a couple observations about Arizona uh, when I was putting this presentation together. First of all, the state motto is DITOT DS, which stands for God in Riches. Very nice motto. The Saguaro. And only in Arizona could a cactus be a state flower, but Jerry has told me that this, yes, is the state flower. And then the third one is the state bird is the cactus wren, or as today we have renamed it to the Twitter bird all over Arizona. So what we want to do, beautiful picture of Arizona. So let's dive into this. I'm going to cover three quick topics here before I turn it over to Jerry. We're going to talk about basically reconning the social media landscape. We'll talk about bits, bites, and barristers. And then we'll talk about can you actually tame this beast. So the first thing, let's talk about a little bit about the social media recon and see what's out there. So what we've seen is that this is kind of like herding cats. If you guys saw that commercial for herding cats, it almost seems like, though, it's mission impossible. And you know what makes this really different? Well, first of all, I know I'm responsible for some of this, but iPhones, Androids, they're selling records amounts. It's not the applications, folks. The applications have to run on something. It's the devices. It's the network. It is creating connectivity and access like we've never had before. This is pushing the desire and the demand for people accessing resources from state and local government and one of the reasons for the call. But let's talk real quick, though, about the downside of some of this, though, too. There's all sorts of stories about the use of social media. Even if it enrages your boss, they say social net speech is protected. Well, maybe not always. Um, they didn't exactly have a sympathy for a reporter at the Arizona Daily Star who went out and posted some things. Even on social media, you're entitled. Your freedom of speech still is limited somewhat, and social media has uh, enhanced that. Now, here's something, too, I found. You know, a man with a fake Twitter account sues the Peoria mayor over a police raid. They didn't like what he was doing, so they raided him off of social media. But here's the one that worries me, and this actually came to pass. How deleting a Facebook post may violate your free speech and lead to a lawsuit, by the way, that was written by a lawyer. By the way, guess what happened? 
sheriff removes a Facebook page after lawsuit over deleted comments. This is exactly gets to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today, what Jerry's going to talk about, what you have to capture, and Neil's going to show you how to capture that so that you folks can avoid having your name spread throughout the paper. By the way, probably well-intentioned, but this is the problem with technology. Unless you understand the new implications, you're going to find yourself uh, being caught on the short end of the stick here. And then for my very last slide, is it possible to tame this beast? Well, you know, Grumpy Cat says no, but I disagree. You know, I believe that there's a way to tame this beast. Anything that man invents, you know, man can put a process around and control, man and women. So I believe that there's a way to do this, and I believe the way you do it is you have to understand what you're dealing with. You have to, you can't manage anything unless you can measure it. So you've got to measure your social media, you've got to manage it, you've got to archive it, and you have to be respons responsive to it. So let's do this. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about on the national media all the time is cybersecurity. You guys need to keep your password safe. Uh, one of my goals was to see if we could hack Forrest Gump's account. And yes, what was his password? You guessed it, one Forrest one. So just as a little cybersecurity tip, make sure you change your passwords often on your social media accounts. You do not want to end up like CENTCOM when they had their YouTube and Twitter account hacked and all sorts of bad things went out over that. So as we get into our show, I'm going to introduce you to Jerry Lucente. But before I do that, um, let's just put up a real quick poll question here. And as, we, uh, as you respond to this poll, I'm going to read uh, Jerry's background. But give us your answers. We'll go over the poll results here for just a second. So just go online and click that. But let's talk about Jerry for a second. Now, Jerry has been a records analyst with the Arizona Secretary of State's office since July of 2008. He serves as the records analyst for state and local agencies, as well as providing records management training around the state. Now, prior to working with the uh, LAPR, uh, he was the Maricopa County records manager for almost four years and has enjoyed being in records management profession for over 20 years. So I can tell you, Jerry has seen a lot of change. He graduated from Arizona State University with a bachelor's degree in history and then has been fascinated by history and records, which obviously being in the records management area from an early age, his interest in records grew in a deep respect for records management during three years of teaching English for a university in northeastern China. Now, there's a, that'll be a story we'll have to talk about later, too, Jerry. So many discussions with the Chinese family of the university students about book burnings, purges, rewrites of historical records, and experiencing firsthand the nation's leadership focused on the future only at the expense of the past made him deeply aware of the importance of preserving our records and history for those who will come after us. So I think that that's a really good uh, uh, way to segue into this, but let's take a look at our poll real, real quick. So what is your opinion on social media as a public record? Overwhelmingly, 75% of you said it is definitely a public record by law, which means you are all candidates for Archive Social. Some of you said it might be a record, but our activity is not worth retaining. Um, I presume that there will be a bevy of lawyers out there that will disagree with you on that. Uh, a few of you said you don't believe it's a public record, and some of you, this is a great time to get educated. You don't know, and that's why we're on the call today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Jerry. So Jerry... The floor is yours, sir. Take it away. Thank you, Morgan. I appreciate that. And uh, I really uh, like the results that showed up. It showed that most of us know uh, that social media is a record. That's usually uh, half the battle in my mind, uh, is convincing people that social me media uh, information is a record. So we've got a great start there. Uh, this afternoon we'll be looking at five aspects of records management for Arizona's public bodies, although most of these really would apply to any type of public body. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is the Arizona Revised Statutes and Records Management, uh, then the intersection of social media and records management, next retention requirements for social media records, and then social media policy points and matrix, and then finally, uh, when do you need something more to help you manage your social media records. Uh, I'd like to let you all know that I'm really honored to be part of this webinar, uh, but my participation today should not be seen as an endorsement of any specific social media software system or solution. Uh, I'm excited to share both my passion and knowledge about records management, uh, and I believe this webinar is a great opportunity to share with those of you that are familiar with social media but may not be as familiar with records management and vice versa. In Arizona, everything that public bodies are required to do when it comes to records management uh, is governed by the Arizona Revised Statutes. Uh, you can see the two main titles up there, Title 41, Article 151, Sections 14 and 19 serve as Arizona's records management statutes. 
And then Title 39, Section 101 to 128, uh, serves as Arizona's equivalent of the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA. I'd like to start with a basic definition of records. Uh, it's about 150 words long in the statute. Uh, it's a little uh, complicated. Uh, it doesn't spell out records or anything nice and handy to help you remember it. Uh, and it also is written in, uh, came up in the mid-50s, I think 54, 55. Uh, so some of you may have been fortunate enough to experience life in the 50s, or you may have just watched Happy Days or seen the movie American Graffiti. Uh, for those of you that weren't so lucky, uh, let me tell you that the 50s bear absolutely no resemblance to today. <laughs> uh, there were only three main media types, paper, photographs, and microfilm. And this, for my daughter account, uh, there was really only one form of connectivity. It was definitely not wireless, and you probably shared this with other neighbors because your telephone was also a party line, which was the 1950s equivalent of social media. So the definition of a record begins in a manner that's very paper-based. Records means all books, papers, maps, photographs, or other documentary materials. And then the next phrase, regardless of physical form or characteristic, is what brings this definition into the 2000s. Uh, so the definition wants to remind us that records are no longer limited to paper or microfilm. Uh, so for a moment, think about all those emails that are in your inbox. Uh, I currently have quite a few waiting for my response, but I'm setting that aside <laughs> while I do this. So think about all those emails that you have. Uh, think about all that content that you have on your social media sites and your websites, uh, all the information and data that's on your C drive or your share drives, your thumb drives, and your databases. All of that information can be a record if it meets the rest of the definition. Uh, the definition goes on to tell us that records are both made and received by public bodies. That's one of the main things that we as public bodies do. We're creating information or we're receiving information. Uh, but in my mind, the real heart of the definition is the very last bullet point there. Uh, the, if you think about all the information and data that you have, if that could serve as evidence of your organization, so your public body, uh, its functions, or maybe even your job functions, your department functions, the policies, decisions, procedures, operations, oh, in case we forgot something, we throw in other activities of the government, or because of the informational value, or because of the historical value of the data, then what you have is a record. So basically, if what you are doing or saying or sending is business-related, then you have a record. Uh, the notable exceptions of course, uh, are what we call non-records, and that would be uh, personal information, personal emails, those types of things, and extra copies of documents that are preserved for uh, convenience or reference only. The Arizona Revised Statutes uh, in Section 14, uh, they require that all public bodies in Arizona establish and maintain an active continuing program for the economical and efficient management of the public records of the agency. Um, I believe that there are some really great benefits to having a good records management program. Uh, one of the most important, especially these days, is financial, uh, which we experience in terms of floor and server space savings, as well as staff and time savings. The other important benefit of a good records management program is uh, risk management related. Uh, you make sure that you always have the information you need when you need it, which provides for compliance. You don't keep what you don't need, which of course will lessen our, the risk posed by information. And then finally, you save valuable staff time because you don't need to provide extra information in response to a public records request, audit, litigation, or investigation, or providing for redaction for those information. When we think about who's managing all of that stuff, uh, I kind of want to move into uh, the next couple slides where I'm talking specifically about the RM of social media. And here are some questions that your public body needs to discuss internally. Uh, the first one there is, what is the difference between data and records? From a statutory point of view, there really isn't one, since the definition for records that we just looked at includes the phrase, regardless of physical form or characteristic. 
although we often break down information in terms of whether it's a record or data, the uh, statutes don't really see a difference. Uh, next, who is res whose responsibility is it to provide records management service to your staff or customers? Uh, I know some will say, well, it's information technology's responsibility because the data resides on their servers and it's usually located in their part of the building or their part of the world. But um, I think really the better question to ask is who is in the best position to manage electronic records and information, which would include social media records. Uh, is it the one who is actually creating the content, or is it the one who's posting the content or the record? Uh, in many uh, instances, I believe IT is merely posting the contents that's been created by someone else to your website or your social media site, uh, so then I would wonder if they're really in the best position to manage those records. And then finally, the question, uh, do these questions really matter? And I believe it's a strong yes. Uh, I have found that when we don't ask these questions regarding who's managing all of this stuff, uh, what we find is that no one is actually managing this stuff because we all think that someone else is doing that job for us. So these are great questions to kind of get your public body thinking about electronic information, uh, including social media. Okay, it looks like the screen froze a little bit. Let me try this one more time here. There we go. Uh, so <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, so when it comes to social media, or actually any electronic communications for that matter, uh, you should be asking several questions related to the content that you're posting or receiving. Uh, the first question you should ask is, is the content a copy or is the content unique information? Uh, remember when we looked at the definition of what a record was, uh, that copies of information are not records per the definition of a record. So that's why we, would, why we need to know, is that content unique or is it a copy? Next, if the content is unique, we need to ask, is that content being retained and managed somewhere other than your social media site? Uh, if it isn't being managed in-house, then you really need to make sure that you're managing the content where it's located. And then finally, the challenges, in my mind, with the intersection of records management and social media, they kind of lie with these last two bullet points. Uh, the Arizona Revised Statutes, uh, number one, require that public bodies control and manage their records during the entire life cycle or retention period of the information. Number two, uh, social media sites really provide no tools to help manage your records on their sites. So in my mind, the real question becomes, how is records management even possible for social media records? And uh, I, like Morgan, have a positive view on that, so let's look at that in a little more detail. Uh, the beginning point of managing social media records lies with how you answer the next two questions. First. How do we determine if social media content is a record? And if it is a record, then the next question we would want to ask is how long do we need to retain or keep social media records? Uh, the answer to the first question really is based on the content. Uh, is the content of that social media post or that social media communication, is the content business related? Uh, if the answer is yes, then what you have is a social media record that will need to be managed. And then when you think about the fact that that uh, social media communication is a record, uh, we need to then think about what the subject matter of that social media content is. Uh, what is the subject matter? Because the subject matter will help you then determine how long you need to keep your social media records. Uh, and then kind of highlighted right there on the page, the most important thing to take away is that social media records are managed by content and not by the format themselves. Uh, and then I've provided a, li a link to our uh, general retention schedule that deals with public information and marketing records. Uh, that schedule really contains uh, all of the record series that are uh, essentially created or received during the social media process. So in looking at 
that schedule, what I wanted to do is I just kind of summarized uh, the retention schedule. And by the way, uh, a retention schedule is nothing more than a timetable that details the related types of information that are a record, and then how long those records need to be kept or retained. So in looking then at that timetable for social media records, we really have three main retention periods, or three main periods of time in which the records need to be kept. Uh, for social media records, the first one there uh, is after the reference value is served. So that one's kind of wide open. It's left up to you as a public body to determine what's the value of that information, how long do I really need to keep that information at what point has the value been served? And the records, uh, the record types that apply to that particular reference value retention period would be graphic art, uh, whether it be developed for temporary or minor projects, or whether it be a draft version of graphic art. Uh, the second retention period there, uh, two years after the calendar year created or received, uh, this really covers most of the records management content in my mind. Uh, so this retention period, uh, two years after the calendar year that the content was created or received, covers the following different types of content subjects. It covers advertising and outreach records, uh, broadcast logs, photographs, press releases, public event records, uh, which include calendars, public service announcements, and speeches. And then finally, uh, a much more rare uh, retention period would be permanent, uh, which is specifically for historical records. Uh, this retention period covers graphic art, uh, which would be in its final version, uh, which is then used for major representations of the public body or the public body services, or for any social media records that have enduring or historical value. So. Uh, it really is uh, at that point if you have any public, uh, the, any permanent social media content, you can consider transferring that to the state archives, but I do believe that that content is going to be rare. The most common ones are after reference value has been served or two years after the calendar year that that content was created or received. I next want to think a little bit about social media policy uh, from a records management perspective. Uh, I think any organization, not just public bodies, but even private uh, companies and, and entities, uh, any organization absolutely needs to have a social media policy in place. Uh, one of the only things that protects your public body in the social media arena is a well-crafted social media policy. Um, so what I have uh, what follows then are some subjects that you really should include in your policy. Uh, I think first and foremost you need to clearly state and understand why your public body is using social media. Uh, then you need to define the roles and responsibilities. I think one of the big ones is what we would call the social media gatekeeper. Uh, they're the ones that really manage or track access to social media sites. Uh, they're probably either managing and tracking even the content that goes on those sites. Uh, I think another important role is the uh, social media content developer. Uh, so those two uh, responsibilities and roles, I think, at least need to be very clearly dis defined and designated. Uh, then you need to think about who owns the content. Uh, in my mind, these, this aspect is very important, uh, especially for us as public bodies. Um, I often see an instance where uh, public bodies will have many, many videos on YouTube, uh, but then when you start asking questions, it turns out that the only copy of those videos actually resides on YouTube. So uh, in, thinking about, <clears throat> in thinking about who owns the content, uh, the first thing I say is if you post something to a social media site, then you own that. Uh, any content posted to social media sites is always the responsibility of the public body that owns that social media account. So if you, if you as a public body have decided that you're going to communicate with the public via a Facebook page, for instance, and you post content to that page, that content belongs to you, not to the public or to the social media site. Uh, secondly, if you owned the content, then you must manage it. Uh, 
in looking at the the statutes dealing with records management, there really is no other choice but uh, the requirement that we as public bodies have to manage our own content. Uh, then if you created the content, I really think that you're in the best position to manage that content. You're familiar with the content, you've created it, I think you should be the one uh, helping to manage that content. Uh, also, hey, Jerry, I think it's... Um, we're getting down, we're, we've got about your two-minute warning, so as we, as we, as we roll into the, the end of yours, let's, let's focus on some of your key points. I know you have a resource slide, so uh, give us some of your key takeaways then for these folks during the last two minutes. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that you really need to make sure you have is a matrix, which is really nothing more than a way of tracking uh, what business or information is on your social media site. I think some of the questions that you need to ask uh, are things like, why are we using social media? Who's our intended audience? Uh, then what are basically the public body's goals for engagement on social media? Uh, what do you want to accomplish? And finally, what's your message? As you think through those, then your matrix will contain uh, basically departments and individuals that are using social media, uh, contain sites that they're using and the links, uh, contain their access codes so that if they ever should leave the public body, you can access that content, uh, and then make sure that the content really reflects the message that the public body wants to provide. The last thing I really want to talk about really is kind of a, a well-rounded approach. When it comes to social media and records management, um, I really want to emphasize the four pillars of records management, which includes having retention schedules, training, policies, documentation. Make sure you've got your social media uh, out matrix out there. You definitely want to make sure uh, that you have uh, not only a – policy in place, but that you're actually practicing the policy, you're auditing the policy regularly. I think when you put all of these together, uh, then you've got a great records management approach. Uh, depending on your level and use of social media, uh, you probably will need a technology solution. Uh, one last thing in thinking about technology, once as you're thinking about your solution, uh, you want to make sure that you know what is required of your public body in order to compliance, then you need to know what your solution can do for you and cannot do for you with that regard, and then you may need to create a workaround to make sure that you've got compliance going. And then I just had a couple slides, but I'm going to push past those. Those will be on there just as uh, some good reference, and that's basically all I have to say. Thank you, Morgan. Hey, you bet. Appreciate, Thank you very much. I appreciate you all joining us. And if you guys can't hear the passion in Jerry's voice, I mean, he really comes across, I mean, we could spend an hour just, just on this part alone. So, hey, look, Jerry, first of all, really appreciate that. Hey, I'm really uh, excited now to introduce Anil Chawla. Anil's the founder and CEO of Archive Social. And now why I tell you a little bit about his background, we're going to put another poll question up. So this one is, how is your agency currently retaining records of social media. So go through those while I read Anil's background, and we'll give you the poll results here in just a moment. So Anil Chawla is the founder and CEO. Always great to get the founder on here because they can answer all of your questions. Of Archive Social, a civic tech company that specializes in archiving social media for public records requirements. Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina in 2010 to launch the world's first open interactive archives of social media. Since then, Archive Social has enabled hundreds of government entities such as Paradise Valley Police, City and County of San Francisco, and the U.S. National Archives, there you go, to ensure long-term transparency for government social media communications. The company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013 and was recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government by leading analyst firm Gartner. So let's take a quick look at the poll results. And, Anil, I know that you want to uh, hop in on this too. So let's take a look at this. Um, well, here we go. So almost 70% of you are not retaining your records and merely rely on the network. So this is absolutely the best time for you guys to be here. Um, 14 and a half, you take manual captures. Obviously, that's very time intensive. 3% of you use some type of a backup tool. 11% have an automated solution. Uh, good for you. And then uh, one and a half percent are already happy archive social customers. So, Anil, it sounds like uh, this is going to be a great time for you to be speaking. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Morgan, for the introduction. And also, thank you to everyone out there who's taking the time out of your busy Tuesday to join us. We have a tremendous 
audience here for the webinar, which really shows uh, how much of an emerging and important issue this really is. Uh, and finally, I have to thank Jerry for participating. It's not often that you have the man or woman in a given state that's the go-to person for, for an issue like this uh, available uh, here for us today to share some of that guidance as well as answer questions. Um, I've talked to a lot of folks across government that were either at the front lines of social media because they were in IT or communications, or they were in the front lines of records management. But it's very rare to find someone that has the knowledge and uh, experience around built issues and is able to combine them together and provide some really pragmatic advice. So thank you, Jerry, again, for your participation today. Now, in terms of this poll and also the poll that we ran earlier, we ran a poll about social media being public record. Hopefully, Jerry, uh, Jerry's presentation helped answer some questions for those of you who, who weren't quite sure what to think about social media as a record. I know about 10% of you mentioned that you weren't sure that your social media was creating records. Uh, and then there were some of you also that felt that social media certainly is not a record. Uh, what I'd like to do in my presentation today is address those, uh, those viewpoints and hopefully change your mind on that. I also want to address the last slide in terms of record keeping. Uh, as we go through, through my agenda here, we're going to talk about some of the real life examples of, of social media that constitute records. So you see some concrete um, postings from different agencies across the country and how those postings can be uh, perceived and maintained as records. We're going to look at legal case studies so you can understand the true urgency of this issue. And then we're going to talk solutions. So for those of you, the 70% the or so that have uh, yet um, to do something about retaining records, I'm going to propose a handful of solutions today, and hopefully you can leave this webinar with, with some action items. Now, I typically start this presentation uh, talking about social media as a record, but we have Jerry with us again. If you have more questions about the rules there in Arizona, uh, certainly I, I ask you to turn to him. I'm actually going to move on with, 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 uh, with my agenda and talk about what does that look like in real life. And so I have a few slides here just demonstrating what kinds of records can create public records for you as an agency. And the first category of communications that can create public records, uh, perhaps the most obvious, is when dealing with emergencies or public safety. We've uh, all have seen the share of, of high-profile uh, crimes or natural disasters in the last several years. Um, and while those, those incidents have been extremely unfortunate, they, they, had, they happen every year. We have these types of incidents. What's been really good to see is how new technology and communications platforms, um, namely social media, um, have emerged to en enable public agencies and emergency response teams to really get the information out rapidly, efficiently, uh, and, and clarify rumors uh, and ensure that the public is protected. And perhaps the most powerful aspect of using social media in an emergency is that you have the power of the network, the virality of your audience to get the information out. So whether you're, you're the city of Boston, Tucson, or you're a smaller town, uh, you have your own emergencies, you have your crimes, and time and time again we find that agencies are using social media as they should to get information out quickly in a time of an emergency. That's a situation where you're not going to have an original record somewhere else. Um, as Jerry mentioned, you only have to keep the original record, but with an emergency you're, you're absolutely going to create original records on social media because the right thing to do is to get that information out. Uh, and to really make that point, this is sort of a trivia fact. We're all familiar with the Boston Marathon bombings and how the Twitter feed for the Boston PD was really what the entire world was focusing on during that, that, that event. The Boston PD, when they finally captured the terror suspect, the very first announcement that they captured the suspect was not a tip to a journalist. It was not a press release. It was not on Boston PD's website. It was simply a tweet that they had captured the suspect. And the most important thing to do was get that information out, so use Twitter to do it. And you can see in that incident how, how clearly this is a record that's worth keeping that needs to be maintained. Now, of course, day-to-day -day law enforcement agencies are, are, are posting information all the time, so it's important for you as an agency to think about the type of content that's going out, as well as the type of information you're receiving uh, in terms of public safety. Now, if you're not involved with emergencies or public safety, uh, which you're probably involved with uh, without, without a doubt as a, as a public entity, is serving your citizens. Uh, in fact, that's the, sort of the foundational um, mission uh, of, of a government agency is to serve the citizens. So providing that customer service and, and receiving that citizen feedback is something that happens each day on social media for practically every agency that's involved in social media. Here's a quick example to, to, make, uh, to make it concrete again. The Texas DOT uh, had a woman trying to reach, reach them via the phone. She couldn't get through the phone line, so she started tweeting to the Twitter account. The Twitter account told her that, well, the phone lines might be busy. 
And ultimately what she discovered was that the phone number that was printed on the mailing was actually incorrect. So she was actually able to get in touch with the agency, notify them that the phone number on the mailing was incorrect, have this conversation, provide the citizen feedback. All of this is happening on Twitter. It's only recorded in this one, one place online uh, on the social network. Um, and many of us, I think, would just gloss over this not realizing that this is, this is just as important of, of a government record as if the citizen has sent an email uh, in or, or opened up some kind of service ticket with IT. So I highly encourage you to look at your social media and look at the, the situations where you are providing citizen service, uh, where you are putting information out in times of emergency or relating to public safety, and think about whether those records really are being maintained elsewhere or if you need to be retaining them on, uh, off your social media site. But even if you do that analysis, the next question you're going to have is, is anybody going to actually ask you for this, is this information? Isn't it just out there on Twitter and Facebook? Why do you need to retain it? Well, as Jerry said, uh, the ARS requires uh, agen agencies in Arizona to have control of the data, so that's probably your, your most important reason. But um, again, to make this concrete, citizens' expectations are changing, and, and you, if you haven't been asked for social media content, you will. And here's an example from the Seattle PD just from last year in April, where a citizen was following the different Twitter feeds that the Seattle PD has for all of the police beats. They actually put out uh, all of the police information on uh, a Twitter feed dedicated to each police beat. And the citizen noticed that occasionally these Twitter feeds were delayed or missing information. So he started tweeting to Seattle PD, and a few tweets then said, I just want the archives of all of your tweets, and please consider this a public records request. So in effect, this citizen made a public records request for social media using social media. Uh, the citizen went on to ask for some additional information that, that you cannot get from Twitter.com, but, but that if you, could, if you had the archives, you would, have, you would be able to get that information. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But the Seattle PD, realizing this was a responsibility that they had to produce this information for this records request, uh, did respond to the citizen and said, give us three weeks to get this information to you. Now, you might not ever receive a request over social media for your social media. Um, but at some point, you may receive one for social media. It may not have happened yet. However, I do want to mention that many of our customers and many agencies that we work with have been receiving requests for social media content, and they haven't even realized it yet. If you look at this list that I have here on the screen, this is the kind of language you often see in a public records request. Any and all documents, all emails and communications, all notifications of, these are broad requests um, for a specific you know, topic or incident, but they're broad in the sense that they're not, they're not specifying the exact uh, format that they want the content in. And so if you think about all notifications of the street closure, and you had put information out during a winter storm on your Twitter feed, well, this request would certainly include your social media. And so many of our customers are, are now, now including social media that they've made through realization. It's something for you to think about as well if you're receiving requests in this format. So hopefully you've seen how your social media is creating records of value, records worth retaining, and how that can happen in a way that those records don't exist anywhere else but social media. You can also see that, that this information is being requested. But um, ultimately what really matters and what really creates urgency to act proactively is to understand the legal context. The best place to start is with the history of, of legal instances that we have around email. Now I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these slides just because we have limited time here today. But I want to mention these two incidents, um, and then I actually have some, 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 some incidents that are closer to home in regards to social media. But this is dealing with email. Um, this is a really important issue to understand because it actually has case law in Arizona. There's a case called Lake versus Phoenix. Uh, it's a bit close to home, so I went with a lawsuit that's actually out of the state of Washington. But both of those lawsuits uh, bear the same result. And basically, these two lawsuits, Lake versus Phoenix in Arizona, and this one in the, in, in the state of Washington, are related to the nature of an electronic record. Uh, a citizen had requested an email. The city was able to produce a copy of the email, but not the original. And the citizen was able to go back and say, I want the original email with all of the original metadata. Now, if you're not familiar with what metadata is, it's basically the information that you often don't see in an electronic message, but it's, that is a part of an electronic message. So with an email, these are IP addresses and information about when the email was sent, who sent it, and so forth. And that's why the citizen asked for it. The city actually couldn't produce that original email with the original metadata. This went to the Supreme Court there in Washington. The Supreme Court in Washington ruled that metadata is part of the public record. It has to be produced, fined the city $100,000, uh, 
The city ultimately had to pay more than half a million dollars because they had to cover the plaintiff's uh, attorney's fees. And this half a million dollars was basically the cost of having a record, but not a complete record. So when I talk about solutions today, we're going to focus on how you can get better and better at having a complete record and mitigate your risk. Now, again, this case follows with email, but email is a perfect analogy for social media. And what we're going to talk about when we look at solutions is the metadata in a social media posting. And this is an example with a tweet. Uh, this is a really eye-opening example because we all know a tweet has no more than 140 characters. Well, that's all that you can see. But underneath that tweet, there are more than 2,000 characters of metadata. And again, as we've seen with case law in both Arizona and, and other states like Washington, that information can be requested as part of the public record. And if you put record keeping inclusions in place, you really want to do the best you can to have that complete record. One other quick example, um, this is actually related to social media, but not public records. So you have to think about social media as more than just a public record, but as a government record. Uh, that could be requested during litigation or e-discovery. This is a case involving social media policy in which the Honolulu Police Department was moderating some content uh, from an advocacy group. And the advocacy group uh, filed a First Amendment lawsuit saying we had a freedom of speech right to express their opinion. Uh, in this case, that opinion is related to, to gun rights. Um, and the city of Honolulu had already re removed these postings, and then they were taken to court for, for removing these postings. So what you have to think about is that Many agencies are moderating content, especially if it's profane. But you could still be taken to a court case uh, for content that you've already removed. Um, and how are you going to tell your side of the story unless you've kept a record? So you really want to have record keeping in place uh, as an agency, whether it's for public records or for your general protection. Now, I mentioned I wanted to take this closer to home. And, and what's been really interesting for us, uh, being, uh, being one of the early companies in this space uh, trying to get ahead of the problem, is that we have a number of customer stories now, customers that, that were proactive um, and then faced a legal situation. In South Florida, we have a customer uh, just recently, in the, uh, actually around the New Year time frame, in which the police department was sharing a scam alert for a local company. Uh, a company had been identified as a scam by some local law firms. So the police department decided to share that uh, on, their, on their social media feeds. And then the company came back and actually um, complained against the police department. The police department removed their posting. The company then filed lawsuits saying that the police department had wrongly stated that that company was a scam when, when in fact they're claiming they're not a scam. Now, fortunately, this customer was proactive to get archiving in place. Uh, when they received the, the lawsuit, they were asked to produce records of these postings they had already deleted, uh, but they had the archives in place and they were able to comply with that, that litigation request. And of course, if they couldn't, they'd be in violation of the public records requirements, so certainly they had to. So that's in South Florida. The next example I have across the country in California where another police department um, was helping fulfill one of the, 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 the programs in the city, a gun buyback program, uh, using social media to get the information out. And the NRA turned around and filed a lawsuit against, um, against the city for, for the way that they were communicating this. And, and the lawsuit requested all the social media postings. So you may just be fulfilling your responsibilities in line with the programs there in your, in your community and, and still face a potential risk. Unfortunately, this police department was actually in a free trial of our product <laughs> at the time that they received this lawsuit. Uh, and were able to use the free trial to produce the information and then, of course, went ahead and signed up with, with our product after that. And then finally, um, over there in the Northwest, uh, Spokane, Washington, um, decided to be very proactive. This was a couple of years ago, put archiving in place because they were worried about this risk. And they were simply promoting a kayaking trip on Facebook where a, a citizen unfortunately died on the kayaking trip, and the lawsuit for that death asked the city to produce all the social media related uh, to, to promoting that event. So simply promoting an event, something very innocuous, is still something that you're doing as an agency. It's part of your business, and it could be requested during litigation. And we actually have a case study that government technology put together that you're able to download. Um, we do have the link in the slide deck that we'll send out, and you can read through that whole case study and see, see, see how the city was proactive and how being proactive really, really saved them from a legal risk standpoint. So with just a few minutes here, I, I promise talking about solutions, so I'm going to get through this. Uh, the first thing that I want to say, though, before we talk about solutions is that you cannot rely on the social networks to have the information. I know about 70% of you are today relying on the data being on Twitter and Facebook. Number one, as Jerry said, under the ARS, the ARS mandates that you, you figure out a way to control this information. You're mandated to do that. Um, but even, even, if, even if that's just a mandate, 
The bigger problem is that this information uh, is not guaranteed to be there for you. Uh, social networks have zero guarantees they've made to, to government entities to maintain this data for the long term. And the moment somebody deletes something, it's gone forever. Now, you might not delete anything you've ever posted, but your citizens can certainly send you information, whether it's a complaint or information for improvement, a crime tip over a private message, and the citizens can delete what they sent you. And as soon as they delete what they sent you, that's gone forever. You may never even know they deleted it, and you've lost a, a government record. So you want to think about record keeping. And, and where a lot of agencies start is with manual archiving. This is copy and paste or taking screenshots. The great thing about manual archiving is that it's essentially free. Uh, you can start doing it today. If you're not keeping any records today, I would highly encourage you to look at doing this, especially if you're moderating content. Take a screenshot, have a record. Uh, but this is not a long-term solution. We have uh, other case studies that I can share with you where, where, where our customers were previously spending 20 to 30 hours a month. Uh, an individual would spend 30 hours a month capturing screenshots to meet this requirement. Not a good use of their time. And ultimately, these are not very good records because anybody can Photoshop anything today or falsify a copy and paste. It's not necessarily going to hold up in a legal situation. A better solution is to look at something automated. There are many backup tools out there like Backupify and SocialSafe um, that are very, very low cost. I believe SocialSafe was something like $20 a year. So if you have really absolutely no budget but you need something automated in place, start with the backup tool. It's a good temporary solution. The thing to keep in mind is that backup is not archiving. Backup is keeping a simple copy. Um, and also, these tools are really designed for consumers, not government agencies. Um, the, the old adage uh, comes true, you, know, you get what you pay for. So if you pay $20 a year, you're not going to necessarily get the level of record keeping that, that you probably need as an agency. But it's a good stopgap. Uh, what you need to keep in mind, though, is that these tools are not built for records management, producing the context of the records, being able to do advanced searches around um, you know, who, who sent the messages and so forth. They have very simple searches. Um, and they're not necessarily as complete as you want, but they're definitely much, much better than not having something in place. Now, a much, much better solution is look, look at an archiving vendor. Um, there are many archiving vendors out on the market. Uh, most of them come from an email archiving or web page archiving background. So when you look at a vendor that comes from an email archiving background or web page archiving background, they're now starting to include social media. The email archiving vendors are capturing social media content and then essentially chopping it up or, or, or sort of uh, normalizing it in a way to go into their email archive so that you can see social media postings in the same place that you could see your email messages. Now, most governments are able to archive email themselves, so they don't necessarily need the main, the main draw of these, of these vendors. But it's worth looking at their social media offerings. What I would caution you on uh, and what you should evaluate, whether it's us or any vendor, um, is looking at how is that data being stored. Uh, if it's being stored in a way that you have the complete record, it's not being altered in any way, you don't want to lose that metadata because of the case law we've seen. You want the raw native record that's untampered with, and you also want to be able to make sense of your communication. So if an email archiving vendor is chopping up your social media into emails, what happens when your Facebook post gets a new comment on it a week later? Is that a separate email that's a week later? How do you put it all back together? Are you even able to put it back together? These are the kinds of things that you really want to evaluate looking at these vendors. Um, these vendors um, are, are reasonably cost. Uh, they're not really out of – they're within budget for a lot of agencies. Uh, you can expect to pay at least a few thousand dollars a year. There may be setup fees and so forth. But it's worth evaluating if you're serious about solving this problem. Now, I've talked about all the different solutions that have been on the market uh, really before Archive Social got into, got into the business that we're in. And ultimately what we want to do is be a resource to you. So whether you work with us or any vendor, here are the four criteria I highly encourage you to evaluate for any record-keeping solution that's your long-term solution. One, how quickly can you get this content from the network? You have to think about frequency because the longer you wait, the bigger time gap there is for data to be lost. You want to get that data as quickly as possible. At Archive Social, we try to capture that content continuously throughout the day so that you have as minimal of a time gap. Um, it's as fast as uh, that, that you know, any technology can provide. We try to capture it as quickly as we can. Comprehensiveness, again, more data is there than less. Um, when it comes to records management, not everything is a record worth keep, keeping forever. It's really based on the nature of the content. But really the only conceivable way to, to, to manage your social media records is to get control of them first. So you have to take an approach where you're capturing everything before you can figure out what to keep and what not, not to keep. And you want to have as much as you can. Authenticity is extremely important. Be really wary of, of, of technology that converts your social media data into something else because you're likely losing data. 
uh, you may not be able to prove the authenticity of that record if it were used in, um, if it came up in court. Uh, and finally, context, I think, is the most important criteria. Can you actually make sense of these communications? You have thousands and thousands of social media communications in a month. Uh, and so over a course of years, can you, can you pull back a Facebook conversation from three years ago and really make sense of it? That's what we're here to provide uh, at Archive Social. Uh, we work with hundreds of agencies across the country on this issue. Now, there are some really good examples of our work out there with agencies that have launched open archives. Uh, I'm actually going to skip the product demonstration today so that we can get to questions, but I highly encourage you to look at these open archives. Nohomish County is, an, is another county that was proactive with an archive in place before they had the mudslide disaster last year. And you actually replay all the emergency response on their social media by going to their open archive. The state of North Carolina has more than half a million records captured with us. The city of Austin was, one of the, was really the first city in the world to launch such an archive. These are all openly available, so you can get a sense of, of how, how easy and automated this, this solving this problem uh, really is. Uh, and with that, here's my direct information, my direct email, my cell phone number. If I can be a resource to you in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can also sample your own social media archive at our website, which will create an archive for you in 60 seconds, and you can see exactly how this works. Uh, but with that, I'm going to hand back to Morgan and uh, hopefully address as many questions as we can. Hey, uh, Neil, great job, and great job, Jerry, too. Look, we've got a ton of questions here, and so I'm going to answer the one main question. Yes, everybody, you will get a copy of this. Unfortunately, Jerry cannot come to work for you personally, so you're going to have to uh, just <laughs> – unless you want to, Jerry. So what we're going to do is uh, – but we're going to – uh, uh, copies in 48 hours. The government technology will provide everybody with a link to the recording. You'll get the slides. So, hey, let's dive into our first question because we had a really good one come up. And, and, Jerry, we'll have you take a pass at this and then Anil follow up. And, and I think this is a great question. We've got one from Katherine Henderson saying, is the burden of social media record keeping a compelling argument for not engaging in social media? So, Jerry, should we not do it because the cost and the burden of doing it is just too overwhelming? Well, I think that's a great question, Morgan, and uh, I think social media is very compelling. You know, in the old days, we want, waited for the public to come to our own, to our buildings, our facilities, and then we waited for them to come to our website. Now the expectation is that we're going to go where the public is, so I don't see uh, any way around public bodies being involved in social media. I think really our audience is expecting us to be involved in social media. I think uh, this webinar, though, is, is uh, kind of a great wake-up about the things that we are required to do. But certainly, don't let that uh, keep you from being involved in social media as public bodies. And, and Anil, I know that uh, you, you make it easy for people to get involved in keeping social media. So what's your take? Well, I absolutely, I agree 100% with, with Jerry. This is at the core of our mission as a company is to, to, to eliminate this barrier. Uh, and, and so for a long time, I think agencies were struggling with, uh, with records management from a technical standpoint of not being able to implement it. And I think that's probably the only, the only real reason um, to, to not engage on social media is that you could be opening up a, a larger can of worms um, if there was just absolutely no way to, to mitigate the risk. However, what we saw is a lot of agencies went ahead with it, and I still think that was the right thing to do, even when the technology wasn't there, um, because the benefits of social media are tremendous. So without a doubt, um, every agency should find a way, if, if, you, if you think you can serve your citizens on social media, find a way to do it. Uh, and then the great, the great part about, about this is that the technology does exist, solutions do exist, even if you have to fall back to manual record keeping for some time, um, it's, it's well worth it. Uh, and then if you have to pay for an archiving solution or you decide to pay for one, um, solutions like ours are, are discretionary spend for 90% of uh, agencies across the country. So it's, it's really something that's very affordable these days. Yeah, so let, let's flip that into a couple of our questions, Daniel, because we've had some questions as how much does archive social cost and what's the installation process involved? And then, Jerry, I've got a follow-up for you. Sure. So, so I mentioned the discretionary spend for, for most, most government agencies across the country. Um, our standard pricing is under $5,000 a year, and that's a fixed price, no other setup fees or anything like that. Um, and that covers, again, 90% of agencies. Um, really, our only customers that pay higher than that are places like Orlando or San Francisco, some of the larger cities. Uh, we actually have pricing that's even under $2,000 a year for agencies that have a smaller presence. So it's extremely cost effective. Uh, and the other part about that is that there's absolutely no IT deployment or configuration. So. Uh, we literally, most of our customers are set up in less than 30 minutes. We actually pull in the history of all of their social media data as well, everything that we can get to. So they're up and running 
30 minutes of effort, you uh, $3,000 a year. Wow, and that actually kind of makes the case too, which is very cost-effective because if you had somebody doing it, you'd easily go through $5,000 worth of somebody's time before you even get through out of the first week probably or two weeks. So um, great point. Hey, um, Jerry, we had one here too, and it was actually interesting because during your presentation, you talked about press releases. So Joyce Driscoll asked, she said she thought press releases had a permanent retention period. However, in your presentation, you state two years. If the press release is posted on social media, is it a copy or is it a record? You know, our our older retention schedule used to have press releases listed as a permanent record. Uh, permanent mean historical. We have changed that, and uh, I would tend to think that if you posted a press release on social media, I would hope you have a copy on site that would be your official record. Uh, but again, I think it's a great idea to make sure that you manage what p appears at social media also. So press releases really based on the content. If they're historical, then it's going to be permanent, but most of them are going to fall under that two-year time frame. And, and here's a question for both of you here, too, because I, I really like this one. This is interesting. This comes from Jennifer Scott. So if you have a disclaimer noted on social media, for example, which is basically you don't want abusive language, that comments which contains foul or abusive language will be removed, does, number one, Jerry, from your standpoint, does that protect somebody from, you know, violating their rights or based on what you've seen? And then, Anil, the other thing, too, is if you do moderate comments, um, how is that captured? You know, what, what's the, why, is there, why should you moderate comments and what's the advantage when you do have the capability to archive them? So, Jerry, wh what do you think from that standpoint? Uh, does it protect them if they have a policy and they moderate comments? You know, I, I'm not quite sure. I know uh, uh, I think that it's very good if you've got a social media policy to incorporate the terms of use. You know, most people that are using Facebook, for example, they're familiar with the fact that, you know, um, foul language, abusive language is not tolerated. So I would encourage incorporating that into the policies and the practices. And that way, you know, if someone happens to post that kind of language, you know, you, especially as a public body, your response can be, you know, uh, uh, Facebook doesn't allow that kind of language, uh, but, you know, we won't be deleting it because, of course, it is a public record. But at least that gives you the reason to uh, uh, some type of justification to take it off your front page. Yeah, and Anil, what have you seen on moderation? Because you've, you, like you said, you've got hundreds of customers. What have you seen out there that's a good practice? Sure. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, that I'm not an attorney by any means. Don't take my 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 direct answer on this. But I have talked to hundreds of of agencies across the country, and and, and without a doubt, every agency feels that they should have the right to establish a policy and then follow that policy when it comes to things like profanity, uh, inappropriate language. Um, you know, even irrelevant content to some degree. Now, the Honolulu case did touch on this. It raised the issue. Now, it was never settled in court because uh, it was never uh, ruled upon in court, I should say, because Honolulu settled the case by paying the plaintiff's fees. Um, but I think most agencies across the country feel that they do have the right to do this. It is absolutely critical. As Jerry said, you, you can kind of incorporate Facebook's terms. It's absolutely critical to establish your own social media policy that makes it very clear when and how you will moderate. Um, if you're looking for a template, we have a free template that we can provide. There's many resources out there. Um, and uh, basically, you know, as you touched on, Morgan, the key point here is that even if you, if you follow the policy and, and, and perhaps you don't need to have the record, or, or but by law you're, what you did was okay, you may still need the records just because somebody's upset. Uh, and so with an archiving solution in place, you can have that capture to have the record even if you remove it from Facebook. Uh, in products like ours, we have facilities that not only capture the records very frequently, but if you're about to moderate something in Archive Social, you can actually go and say, Archive Now, and immediately get the content in the archive so that you're free to moderate it as quickly as possible. That's a good point. And look, we've got so many questions here, and folks, unfortunately, we can't get to them all because we have to be respectful of our one-hour limit here today. So, um, so let's let's talk about this. Uh, we have to wrap it up here. I want to thank, first of all, Jerry for being on the call. Jerry, like I said, great passion, great knowledge. Uh, people here are pinging you away, so you've got job security. Trust me, friend. Uh, people want you <laughs> want, want your time. You're going to be spending some time on Q and A. And Anil, always great to have the founder of a company hop on, you know, and and really and dive into this. And obviously, you've solved a huge issue for people. So I want to say thank you for both of you, and obviously thank you especially to our partners at Archive Social for enabling us to bring 
that's exciting. And, and, and folks, it's going to be exciting because it's something you're going to have to address, but it's the cutting edge. And I think this is a really great solution. So thanks once again. We look forward to seeing you at another government technology event. Everybody have a great day, but keep tweeting. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>